the red light has come on, which means uh, the lecture can begin. So, let's, let's see if I can get through everything I want to get through, and we can actually get to some, a little bit of hiding. So, lecture is broken up into three parts as usual. And the first part is the methodology and the questions we're going to be looking at. And we're looking at two questions. Right? Our first question is, why is there something? Oh, not give me self on the space. Why is there something rather than nothing? Now, this is a very philosophical question. Um, actually, show of hands, who's ever wondered this? Who's ever asked themselves, why is there anything? Anyone? Yeah, quite a few people. All right. Don't feel bad if you haven't. Um, it's a very interesting and quite difficult question. And so what I want to do, first of all, is to break it down a bit. So, the first thing we might look at is why. Last week I said there are kind of two kinds of why questions. There are ones that are about explanation and ones that are about justification. <coughs> this is very much a question about explanation, first of all. But we can <laughs> dig a little bit deeper. Um, so, let's say that here, what we're interested in asking why, is seeking ground. <coughs> This, this word ground is quite significant, right? What it means is something like a reason for. Like we're asking for the reason why something is the case. Um, and we can break these down into at least two different categories, right? One is to say we can seek temporal grounds. Right? And this is what we're most used to asking when we talk about causes. And we can talk about two kinds here. On the one hand, we can talk about what you might call the diachronic. And on the other hand, the synchronic. What do I mean by those? Well, uh, diachronic is, for instance, uh, you know, uh, why am I wearing my jumper today? Right? Because this was the jumper on the top of my drawer. Right? Like that one thing happened, <laughs> somebody put. Maybe, well, I at some point put my, my jumper in at the top of the drawer, and then later on, I wear it, right? One thing after another. That's that what diachronic means. On the other hand, uh, a synchronic question is, is more of like, so, <coughs> a little bit of physics. Say I've got a wooden beam, right? And I put a weight on it, and the beam bends. Right? One kind of question you can ask is why is why was the beam bent, right? Because I put the weight on it, one thing after another. But the other kind of question you could ask is why is it still bent? Right? Like why is at any moment it in this state? And the answer is because it's got a weight on it, right? But that's not a one thing after the other question. Those two things are at the same time. Right? That's what we mean by a kind of synchronic. <laughs> Uh, issue of grounding, right? Uh, then we might want to consider, as opposed to this, a temporal ground. So things that aren't really to do about time. Uh, so let me give you two examples here as well, physical and the mathematical. So, if we abstract a bit further from our, our ben, bent wooden beam example, we could ask, well, what is the law governing the way that this is bending? Right? We can start talking about the laws of physics. Right? And the laws of physics, although they tell you what happens in time, they are not themselves temporal. <coughs> At least, this is what most people think. Some people would debate that. Right. Okay, but we can go even deeper and we can talk about mathematical grounds. So you might ask, 
Why are the internal angles of a triangle, why do they always add up to 180 degrees? Right? That's not, got nothing to do with anything related to time. Right? And you might provide an answer like, well, because we're drawing them on a Euclidean plane. Right? And if we were drawing on a Euclidean plane, they wouldn't. Right? So for instance, if you draw a triangle on the surface of a sphere, the internal angles will add up to different things. Right? That discussion is about grounds, but it's got nothing to do with time. Right? Again, grounds are reasons. So, um, here's a, okay, I'll give one further example because I've talked about uh, before how the Greeks were obsessed with dynamics and trying to explain dynamics. So Pre-Socratic philosophers were doing physics, right? Um, and the most clear example is they were interested in the weather, right? So, <coughs> let's talk about a storm. Right? We can ask all of these <coughs> kinds of questions about something like that. Right? We might ask, okay, why is this hurricane tending towards Florida rather than going into, going into Central America? Right? We might say, well, huh, because there was a wind blowing from the north. Right? Or oh, wind blowing from the south. Right? The diachronic kind of answer. Synchronic, we might ask, why does the hurricane have the strength that it has at this very moment? We might answer, because the surface of the water it's traveling across has a certain temperature. Right? Because hurricanes feed off temperature. Right? Okay. Then we might ask, well, how does this work? Well, then we'll go into physics and we'll talk about thermodynamics. We'll talk about how a system like that is actually powered by heat. Okay? And then mathematics. Hmm. What's the interesting thing here? So, I, I want to just briefly mention one of my favorite bits of mathematics because it has the most ridiculous name. The hairy ball theorem. <laughs> right? The hairy ball theorem shows you why storms exist. Because there must be at least one storm on the surface of the Earth at any moment. There, can't, there couldn't be a completely calm day in which there were no winds, right? And the reason for this is a pure mathematical theorem that shows you that you, you can't, for instance, get a sphere that's covered in hair and comb it all flat. There's always going to be a cow, right? The same thing. So, mathematical atemporal grounds for a thing that we can actually see. Okay, right, that's why. Let's talk about nothing. Right, nothing rather than something. And we could even talk about nothingness if we wanted to. Now, when we're asking why there's nothing, what we're doing is, in a certain sense, explaining absence. And what I want to do is to distinguish between two different kinds of absence, what you might call relative absence <coughs> and absolute absence. So, um, if I walk into an empty flat and I say, why is there nothing here? Right? The nothing I am talking about is quite specific, right? I'm not saying there's no air in the room. I'm not saying there's no light. I'm not saying there's no carpet, right? I'm saying there's no furniture. There's no people. There's no <laughs> sense of something being lived in, right? In fact, within my question, why is there nothing here, there are a bunch of what you might call implicit restrictions, right? And there are two kinds of restrictions we can talk about here. One might be a restriction of type and the other of context, all right? So here's a different question. Like, we're at home and, I don't know, having a, an interesting discussion, and I ask, 
Why is there no beer? Right? Right, that's a sort of type restriction. <coughs> I'm asking for a particular kind of thing. Right, why is there no beer? Right. Um, similarly, what's also implicit in that question is why is there no beer here? Right, in my class, in, within our reach of the drink. I'm not saying why is there no beer universally? Right, because there is some beer. Like, the universe contains some beer somewhere. Um, so what we have here is, in various different situations, nothing is kind of the limit case. Right? Something covers a whole variety <coughs> of numbers. Right? There might be six bottles of beer, ten or whatever. Right? <coughs> nothing is the least there can be. Right? It's a limit case. Now, the absolute absence here is going to be the limit case of limit cases. Absolutely nothing. Right. A universe with nothing in it. No specific context within which things can be absent. No specific types of things <coughs> to be absent. Just nothing. Right. And this is quite interesting to think about. And the one thing that I want to get you to think about is that what this does is kind of connect everything and nothing. Because similarly, when we want to talk about everything, usually we, we're meaning something quite specific. Nothing else, everything on the face of the earth. Everything that's physical. Right? Everything that's physical, right? But often philosophers want to talk about no, no, not specific everything. Absolutely everything. Right? The whole world, the whole ship. Everything that is. And there's an interesting connection between that. Right? So when we're saying why is there something rather than nothing? We're after the big nothing, right? The full, absolute nothing, which is the flip side of everything, right? Okay. Everybody all right with that? Okay. Feel free, as I say, if, if I say something that's a little bit confusing, put a hand up. Right. Here's our second <laughs> question. Is time real? And again, I'm going to do a very philosopher thing. I'm going to, first of all, say, well, OK, what do we mean by time? So crucially, and this is, this is why I do this philosopher thing, if you want to have a disagreement <coughs> with someone about what time is, you both need to have some understanding of what you mean by time. Because otherwise you'd be talking past each other. It's the same with any disagreement. <coughs> you need to know what you're both talking about so that you can say different things about it. Right? So what we need here is some basic understanding of the meaning of time which gives us clarity on the question. So here's two ways of looking at it. One, we have the various <coughs> features of time. Past, present, and future. Like any theory of time that didn't explain those three things, we'd think probably wasn't a good theory of time. Right? In fact, we'd think it probably wasn't a theory of time at all. So that's one thing. The other three things I want to point out are what you might think of as features of the experience of time that we, we might want to account for. So one is what you might call dimensionality. Another word for that would just be extension. Right? We think of time as like a line, and you can talk about times <coughs> on that line. Right? You can measure time as a quantity. Right? 
The next would be directionality. Intuitively, uh, no, okay, <coughs> too many letters. Uh, intuitively, we like to think of time as a line going in a very particular direction, from past to future, or alternatively from future to past, if you think of stuff <coughs> coming at you, right? But either way, we tend to intuitively think time goes in one direction. Finally, there's what we might call flow. And this is the idea that time is not simply something that is extended and which goes in a particular direction, but which is actually going. Right? There's actually a sort of flow of experience rather than uh, you know, us existing as a kind of crystalline universe. There is something that we're in, in time. By flow, are you referring to motion? Well, this is the question, okay. right? <laughs> and we'll get to it. Because some people will say, and Aristotle will say, time is motion. And other people will disagree with him, including August. So, those are three things to think about. Well, four things-ish to think about when you're thinking about a theory of time. Here's the other thing, real. What the hell do we mean when we say something's real? Um, and this, this is quite a difficult one because the way we tend to use the word real uh, sort of in common parlance is we treat it as sort of synonymous with exist. Right? So like real, see, real for us seems to be kind of like existence. But that's that's a sort of binary property. Either something exists or it doesn't. <coughs> Whereas, if you listen to Augustine, he will talk about degrees of reality. Right? So if in God is the most real, and then everything else, as it comes down the hierarchy of emanation, is less real. Right until you get to the point of nothing where you have no, no reality. Right. So we might think that that's a bad way to talk about reality, but it's important that we understand how he's using the term. Um, <coughs> here's a couple other ways, uh, a couple other things to think about when we're thinking about what we mean by reality. So there is a very important term which comes down from Greek philosophy, which is substance. That's actually the Latin translation of a Greek word, ousia. Right? Substance literally means kind of standing under. Right? Um, ousia in Greek was quite an everyday word. So it's, they, they, would, they would talk about ousia in the sense of the goods. Like, who has the goods? Right? Are, you a, are you a person of substance? Do you have wealth? Right? It's like the cash value. Right, the underlying thing that gets things done. Um, and this is really sort of introduced as an important term by Socrates, and subsequent philosophers think about it in different ways. Um, but the crucial thing is that, so you know I, I talked about how, how Plato takes a variety of distinctions that the pre-Socratic philosophers thought were important, and tries to kind of unite them together. The concept of substance is one of the ways in which this happens. So in, for substance, we might want to think about the distinction between reality and appearance. Right. What's substantial is the reality, and appearance is sort of insubstantial. It depends upon the reality. Equally, though, we could talk about the distinction between ground and grounded. Right, that thing that we just talked about in relation to why. Right, these things are kind of tied together. The substance is the ground upon which the appearance depends as an effect. 
here's one final way of thinking about this, which is we might talk about phenomena. You know, appearances. But phenomena are also in contemporary scientific parlance that are things that need to be explained. Come across a phenomena. There's always a storm somewhere on Earth. How do we explain it? Right? So, one way to think about how this relates to the other things we're going to be talking about today is in terms of a distinction between the subjective and the objective. Because, for certain phenomena, you might want to say that they aren't, real, they aren't really real. There's nothing to them other than appearance. Right? This is what, what you'd call an epiphenomenon. So what some philosophers will argue is they'll say, time is an epiphenomenon. It's not real. Right? It's just the result of something more important that underlies it. Part of our experience, yes, it's a subjective thing, right? But there's no objective reality to it. And this is the kind of theory of time that Augustine is going to be putting forward. So, um, let's move on to Augustine. Well, let, let's quickly, any clarificatory <coughs> questions? Yeah? No? Okay. So, Augustine. Now, we've already discussed how basically Augustine was, in a sense, converted to Christianity by reading Plotinus. <laughs> because Plotinus enabled him to understand the Christian doctrine. Right. And what we talked about last week was the theory of evil and sin. Right. Plotinus provided Augustine with a theory of evil as nothingness. Right. Evil is nothing. It's just absence right, of being. But Plotinus also provided him a theory of creation. And crucially, a theory of creation ex nihilo, right, out of nothing, right? And this is very important to a Christian theologian because this is one of the doctrines you can't get rid of. The idea that God creates the universe out of nothing is fundamental to Christian doctrine, right? And it is a doctrine that other people will disagree with. So I mentioned Aristotle earlier. Aristotle will claim the universe has always existed and always will exist. Right. There is, the idea of a beginning point or an initial moment of creation is not quite right for him. Uh, and so a Christian theologian needs to argue against this kind of thing. He needs to have an account of what it means for God to create out of nothing. And what Plotinus gives to Augustine is a theory of creation as emanation. Right. I'm not going to draw it on the board again. But this idea of the one kind of emanating through different layers, through thought and soul and spirit into various things in creation, right? That's a theory of creation as emanation. And crucially, the way to understand this is this is a theory of God as an atemporal ground. This is not a theory of God as sitting at the beginning of time. <coughs> And kicking things off. This is a theory of God as standing outside of time in eternity and creating time itself. Right. So Augustine's <coughs> big question, and he thinks this is a question that has to be answered, right, is what was God doing before creation? Right. He thinks that people who ask this question are asking a serious question. Right. His answer is Actually, it doesn't even make sense as a question, right? There was no before creation, right? Because time itself was created. 
Uh, there was no time in which God could be doing something. The very idea of doing depends upon time. Right? So Augustine's theory of God as eternal and creating time is his way of <coughs> validating Christian doctrine. Um, so, um, I wanted to say a little bit more about the, the basic elements of this. This is, this is just me going through the reading that you were set, book 11. Um, and then we'll, 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 we'll move from talking about the specific nature of creation to talking about time specifically. So, okay. Here's what Augustine thinks creation is. <coughs> creation, right, is speaking the word. <coughs> it's worth bearing in mind that the word is from the Christian perspective, Jesus. Jesus is the Logos, the Word of God. And even before he was a man, right, Jesus always existed as a certain aspect of the Trinity. And this is the aspect of the Trinity. Right, so, the Word. Right. Now, Augustine <coughs> says, okay, this is the doctrine. How do I understand it? And he gives us sort of two sort of problems. So the first is, he says, like, if Moses gave the truth of the law to me in Hebrew, I wouldn't understand it. Because, well, I personally wouldn't understand it because I don't speak Hebrew, but neither did Augustine. <coughs> right. So there's this sense in which the same thing can be communicated in a variety of different languages. Um, and what Augustine says is that the word that God speaks is in no language. Right? It is pure meaning. Right? Pure meaning independent of any of those pesky actual linguistic features that are required for humans to explain things to each other. Pure meaning. Right? Then he says, well, when humans speak, it's something that happens in time, right? When we speak, when I'm giving this lecture, you know, I have to start with one word and get to another word, and then I maybe have a sentence, and then maybe somebody understands me, right? Um, but the word as the basis of creation cannot itself be created. Right. Anything that is created is in time. Anything that is in time is created. Right. So the word must rather be pure truth. And this is truth before expression before the things that are created. <coughs> How should we think about this? Well, there's a very good metaphor that keeps getting used in the Christian tradition, which is the book of nature. So the book of nature is the thing that contains all the facts, all the things that are true. Right. So it contains mathematics. It contains the laws of physics. It contains every specific fact, including the fact that I put my jumper at the top of the drawer and that I wore it, wore it today and that I'm not currently wearing it because I took it off. Right? All of the facts about everything that is atemporal and, and everything that is temporal are in the book of nature. Right? And this is what we mean by truth, pure truth. God creates by fixing the facts, by fixing what is true, right? But that is not something that happens in time. God does not write <coughs> the book of nature within nature. Right? This is the speaking of the word. God speaks the truth. And the things that are spoken are here. 
Okay. Right. He has one final thing to say. So, in providing this account of creation as speaking the word, as being pure meaning of pure truth, what Augustine is resisting is the idea that creation is craft. And again, this is sort of important for the conflict with Aristotelianism because Aristotle will think about a lot of things in terms of craft. Right? Like the actual making of something. And Augustine's point is creation is not craft because craft is itself something that happens in time. Actually making, that's something temporal. And if it's temporal, it is created rather than the basis of creation. Right. So, again, God doesn't do anything because doing is in time. God simply speaks the word. Okay. Right, let's get on to Augustine's theory of time. So, <coughs> what I've said already is that, you know, Augustine <laughs> takes this question, what was God <coughs> doing before creation? And basically says the whole idea of doing and before don't apply. And the reason he says this is because times <coughs> are created. And remember, times are things we can talk about. We can talk about yesterday, two years ago, uh, 2012, or three, let's go further in the future, 2020. Right? We can talk about these times. Right? And for him, they are, they are created. Um, and crucially, what he will say is that times um, times are only present in part. And by contrast, eternity is present as a whole. So this is his way of thinking about <coughs> times as things that are created versus eternity, that on the basis of which creation happens. However, this creates a sort of fundamental perplexity, right? So what Augustine will say is, like, we all think we understand what we mean by time. If I ask you what is time, you think you understand until you try and answer the question and then you find out that you don't really understand, right? And so what he needs to do is to work through a particular perplexity that this basic way of thinking about time produces. So let me let me put down the argument roughly. Um, and this is definitely an argument. It has kind of premises and a conclusion. So first of all, Augustine argues that the past and the future are not. They don't exist kind of by definition, right? The past is no longer, and the future is not yet, right? So past and future times don't exist, right? OK. Then he argues that the present has no duration. How does he argue this? He says something like, okay, take today, right? Today is a time, right? But we 
can always zoom in further and find bits of today that are present, well, sorry, bits of today that are past and bits of today that are future. So, you know, like, the hours before this hour are past, <coughs> the hours after this hour are future. But we can zoom in further and talk about this minute, this second, this nanosecond. We can keep getting finer and finer and finer. And so the present, as this kind of pure moment between the past and the future, doesn't actually have any duration, it doesn't have any length. Right. Okay, so these are his kind of basic premises. And then what he points out is, three, but we measure times. Right? And, well, there's three A, because this is basically the same thing. Right? Measurement requires existence and duration. If a time doesn't exist and it has no extension, how can you measure it? How can you compare different times and say one is longer or shorter? Right. So, like, that is incompatible with the arguments he's just put forward. Right. He's worked us into what looks like a kind of absurdity. And if that's the case, he needs to provide a way out, provide a way of reinterpreting our understanding of time to get out of this. Right? Um... Okay, so the first thing he'll do is, well, basically what he does is he says, we've got two ways out, right? One is Aristotle. And Aristotle will basically say that time is motion, or it's the number of motion, I think, mean. right? And... I don't want to go into Aristotle too deeply, but <coughs> when Aristotle talks about motion, he just means any process of change. So, like, movement like that is change in space, change in location. But there's also, like, decay. Like, get an apple from the tree, you leave it out, and it will go right and then wrong. Like, that's change, right? Aristotle basically says, look, time is motion. And crucially... He thinks of this in terms of the ideal motion of the planets, right? So a day is just the movement of the sun. Um, Augustine's response to this is quite simple. He basically says, look, rest takes time. <coughs> Things that don't change don't change for a time, right? Like, not everything is constantly changing. And you can have different lengths of time in which something remains the same. If that's the case, then time can't be motion. Like, theoretically, nothing could change, and time would still go on. Okay. So what's Augustine's actual answer? If this is done, right, what's Augustine's answer? His answer is that, essentially, time as we experience it is subjective. Right. And the way he will do this is he will say, in fact, what we have are memory, the past of the present, attention, the present of the present, and expectation the future of the present. Insofar as these things are psychological, they are with us now in the present. My memories are now. My <laughs> expectations are now, even though they point to things that are no longer, or not yet. That's Augustine's theory of time. 
And the crucial thing is you can see why he has to create this theory of time. <coughs> he needs this in order to make his picture of eternity and creation consistent. Now, in seminars, I'd like us to think a bit more about how this works. How does this psychological theory of time allow him to deal with things like prophecy and measurement? Because he needs to have accounts of those things. But also, I'd like us to think about whether this is compatible with his theory of original sin. Because his theory of original sin requires free will. Right? Is this theory of time compatible with a theory of free will? Are the two halves of Augustine's theology at odds with one? Okay. That's the end of my discussion of Augustine. I'm going to try and go into Heidegger, but <coughs> any clarificatory questions? Speak now or forever hold your feet. Or at least hold them <coughs> until seminar. Yeah? How does the theory of time relate to the theory of free will? Well, um, it's to do with the conflict between free will and determinism. So... If you think that God creates the universe from outside of time, God creates the whole of your life all at once. Right? So God seemingly sets things up in a way where he knows whether or not you're going to sin in advance. In fact, he has written the part of the book of nature in which you sin. Right? How is that compatible with the idea that sin is free will? This is the issue. Time, in the sense of times as opposed to eternity, is all in the present for us. But again, there's a kind of potential conflict there. And this is kind of what I want to talk about with regard to Heidegger. So, uh, where's the best bit of the board to use? I'll tell you what, I'm going to use this side. Um, so... <coughs> The first thing I want to do is mention something about Heidegger that's not contained in the reading I said, which is that... So Heidegger, in his famous kind of book, Being and Time, Sein und Zeit, um, he basically puts forward a criticism of the Greek conception of substance that I was talking about, Uzziah. And he says that essentially the Greeks always understood Uzziah in terms of the present. What is present? What is now? Right? Um, and this causes a certain kind of circularity. And this circularity is completely present in Augustine. Right? Because so if you think about the part of Augustine's argument where he says the past and future are not, right, they are not because they are not present. <coughs> Non-existence and existence are already stood, understood in temporal terms. Right? And crucially, what Heidegger will say is that for Augustine, eternity, this crucial concept for everything, is in fact constant presence. defined in terms of the present. So when Augustine comes to give a theory of the present itself, in contrast to eternity, he's gone in a circle. Right. Okay. That's what Heidegger has to say about time. Here's what he has to say about nothing. Right. So I want you to recall in the first lecture, I talked about what philosophy is about. And I said, in a certain sense, philosophy is about knowing nothing.
But in a some, so, so another sense, it's about knowing everything. Right? There's this tension between the concepts of everything and nothing, but also a connection between them. And this is what I was saying when I talked earlier about uh, everything and nothing and the absolute sense. So Heidegger thinks that this question, why is there something rather than nothing, is like the representative metaphysical question. Not because he thinks it can be answered. Actually, Heidegger thinks this question can't be answered. Rather, why he thinks it's interesting is because it turns our attention to the nothing. Not just any nothing, but the nothing. The absolute absence. Right? And he thinks that um, understanding this absolute absence is the step on the way to understanding being. What is... Um, so... Here's the, the simple way to try and explain this. So Heidegger will talk about Dasein. And this sometimes gets translated as existence. But, but it doesn't just mean any existence, right? It means the kind of existence we human beings have <coughs> as free creatures, right? Heidegger thinks that we are held out into the nothing. Insofar as we are free, we are immediately connected. <coughs> what does he mean by this? He means that um, actually, as free creatures, we are immediately connected to everything. But everything is not, as it were, the objective everything, the objective totality of things that are, but rather a subjective thing. It's a phenomenon, right? What he, the way he will describe it is as a horizon, right? Each of us experiences the world as world, which is to say we have some relation to the totality of everything, right? And this comes back to that philosophical question. What's the meaning of life? What's, what's the meaning of everything? What's the whole shebang about? Right? We all have some intimate connection to everything. Not in terms of specific beings, but in terms of the horizon <coughs> of experience. And Heidegger thinks that we can only encounter this horizon properly by experiencing it as nothing. Right. The absolute nothing is the world evacuated of context. To understand the structure of everything, you understand it minus its content. And that's the nothing. Right. And he thinks the way we specifically confront the nothing is through what he will call existential anxiety. Or existential anxiety. <coughs> an attitude in which we are not afraid of anything in particular. We're not afraid of anything in the world. Right? In fact, we're anxious about everything. Everything starts to lose its significance. And nothing has meaning. Right? That's, for him, this encounter with the nothing. Now, what this means is that, in a certain sense, being, that kind of structure of everything qua everything, just is nothing. Because the structure is everything minus anything. Right? And the nothing, well, the nothing nihilates, or the old way of translating it, which I really like, is the nothing noths. Right? Nothing noths. The nothing is doing something. And what this means is being is time. Because this structure of the world, minus anything in the world, the structure of human experience, <coughs> minus what is experienced, is time. 
in order to be free, we must have a past, a present, and a future, in which we confront the world and what we want to do in it. And that's Heidegger's critique of Augustine. Right. Augustine thinks nothing is what is opposed to being. Being is goodness, nothing is evil as absence. Heidegger will say no. <coughs> we need to understand that nothing is a positive thing. Not just a mere absence, it's a positive structure. And if we understand that, we understand being and our place. That's Heidegger. So, um, again, I don't expect everybody to necessarily follow that. This is a taste of more difficult <laughs> philosophy that comes later, which is directly related to Augustine. So if you want to maybe understand this, understanding Augustine, it's quite useful. Any final questions? Anyone?